Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Subjectively Correct Podcast, a movie podcast hosted by myself, Josh, and my good friend, Matt. Hello. And each month we pick a couple of films that the other has, well, a film that the other one has not seen, uh, but in alignment with a theme that we select randomly at the end of each episode. And this month's theme is Feel Good Movies, which we picked at the end of last episode. And we have a couple of quite diverse films, I think, to talk about mm-hmm. this time. Very true. Perhaps not the kind of feel good that I think a lot of people might expect as well. Although both films, I think, made me feel good. I don't know about you, Matt, but... <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. We have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, as uh, Matt's film is the oldest one, we're going to kick it off with his in this first half and then head on to mine after that. So why don't you introduce it for us, Matt, and let us know what it's about and what we're going to be talking about. Uh, of course. Well, I brought the 1991 White Fang um, movie adaptation based on the uh, novel of the same name by Jack London. Uh, this was a Disney production, and it's uh, directed by Randall Kleiser, who also did masterpieces like Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, and maybe more <laughs> genuine Flight of the Navigator and Grease, debatably. Well, he made those, he directed those movies as well. Uh, starring Ethan Hawke, Kla- Klaus Maria Brandauer, Seymour Castle, Jet the Dog, who uh, I, I, we will probably be talking about more. Uh, later <laughs> and a bunch of other uh humans mostly um yep. written by gene gene or jan rosenberg nick Thiel, david fallon composed music composed by basil polydorus and hans zimmer uh two mm. great composers and this soundtrack uh rocks fucking hard and yeah the the, the story it is about um it's about a, a young man named Jack Conroy who is uh, traveling to the Yukon to uh, claim his deceased father's mine up in the mountains, you know, with big dreams of uh, uh, money and fame, I guess, or mere money, not fame. And he um, is joined by two older gold diggers who are, um, he talks into helping him find that old mine. And on the way, on the journey through the ice and snow, they cross paths with a, the titular dog-wolf hybrid, White Fang, which the main character, Jack, uh, eventually develops a strong bond with. That's basically the story. And I picked <laughs> this one as a feel-good movie because it's genuinely one of those go-to, uh, go-to films when I, I don't know, when I feel bad or whatever and I want to just get cozy, pick me up. Uh, ironically, I was actually sick uh, in the weeks leading up to this recording. And since this is already a movie that I often have rewatched when I was sick to feel better, it was very fitting. And it probably has helped my condition, uh, at least mentally at the time as well. Um, on that note, though, if you, if you hear me coughing a little bit, that's just, you know, the last remnants of that. But... I think that's proof for me that this movie still works as a feel-good movie. It's just, I mean, you got, I don't want to blow up Disney that much, but, you know, every every once in a once in a time they do, you know, hit the mark right. This movie has a very, very charming and comfortable, family-friendly Disney vibe to it with the uh, beautiful orchestra score that's overlaid over this majestic, um snow snowy mountain images that i just that 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 i just adore every time i see them the first couple of scenes to just introduce the whole setting and stuff is so goddamn beautiful in my opinion and then of of course you have the funny the the just pretty simple just nature journey through this environment of the protagonists that just is a simple premise for a story that I can engage with really easily uh, with all these beautiful nature uh, visuals and then of course you eventually get to the uh, super cute and wholesome uh, dog human friendship stuff with all the obligatory uh, melodramatic sad moments and all of that but also some cool action i think and 
Yeah, the, the Dog Wolf Hybrid White Fang, played by Jed the Dog, which we have mentioned before uh, in our pilot episode when we talked about the 80s The Thing movie, where Jed the Dog plays the initial uh, creature, basically. Uh, Jed the Dog is... Well, I'm always a huge fan of animal actors, or whatever you want to call it, like trained animals for movies, that stuff. And Jet the Dog is just a legend. And both of these films, White Fang and um, The Thing, are just two movies that uh, have probably shaped my taste growing up a ton. White Fang especially, because I, there's a lot of nostalgia attached, because I did see this the first time as a kid, had it recorded off TV, saw it again and again, probably... Probably was one of the major things that ingrains like the love of like Arctic settings and, uh, you know, animal characters or whatever in me. Mm. And uh, nostalgia, I think nostalgia in general is, would probably make, add to a lot of really good movies for some people. Uh, you haven't seen this movie before though, so I would be very interested even from that perspective. How did this movie work for you? not seeing it as a kid, but seeing it now as an adult for the first time. Yeah, uh, oddly enough, I I knew, I knew of White Fang, but, yeah. yeah, have never seen it until just recently when I watched it for this. And, yeah, it's pretty much everything you said I can't, I, I, I don't disagree with. That's that's the, the film. It's a very simple film, I found. Like It's mm-hmm. very much a, a Disney family-friendly, like you say, uh young guy makes friends with dog and yeah that's that really <laughs> not yeah. that that's a bad thing like not not that I'm I'm paying it out for that or anything like that's that's not bad at all but in a good kind of feel good way it is very simple it is very um what's the word like direct i guess in what it's trying to achieve mm-hmm. and yeah i was very happy to see ethan hawk in it cuz I, I didn't realize he was in it until yeah. i started watching cuz i don't really look up much and I really like Ethan Hawke anyway. So having a young Ethan Hawke on board was always a, a good thing in my book. I think as well there's some stuff towards the end which I I reckon is has been parodied or oh, yeah. uh, used a lot. The stuff where he's basically telling yeah. you know, the dog to go away and getting upset about it and stuff because he's, tr- he's treating him mean because it's the best thing for the dog or he thinks it is and that kind of thing. And... I've seen that parodied a lot of times where it's almost that that scene verbatim and mm. but in a different show or something. So I reckon that's where it originated from, which is always interesting to see where that kind of stuff starts. But I can definitely see how yeah, if I was a young if I was a kid and I saw this film, I probably would have loved it too. And <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> as it not that I didn't love it now, but <laughs> I'm just saying I probably would have this I'd probably have the same attachment to it if I had seen it in like 1991 when it came out, and yeah, you know, I I would have I would have connected with it a lot more than I did now, as much as I did enjoy it now, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> but uh, I agree. I thought the setting was fantastic because I also like those sorts of settings, that kind of frontier, but snowy mountains frontier america canada kind of you know yeah is a very appealing landscape to me anyway and i like that kind of thing and this is the kind of film where i watch it going oh man i could go live in a cabin in the middle of nowhere yeah yeah exactly it's like watching um have you seen the film into the wild i don't think so which isn't well in that film there's Dude basically goes to Alaska and lives in the middle of nowhere for a while. There's a lot more to it, but that's, you know, mm-hmm. the main thrust. And watching that film as well, I was like, oh, man, yeah, that would be so good, just living in the middle of nowhere <laughs> yeah. in this beautiful landscape. Because that whole, you know, Northern America, Canada, kind of Alaskan region is just so beautiful. And I'd love to go there sometime and actually check it out for, for real. And probably go live in a hut somewhere. That would be <laughs> a lot of fun. But uh, for a while, well, not yeah, forever, I mean, probably. <laughs> yeah. It's funny though. I mean, not to go on a tangent, but I always think, you know, would you would you want to hook up the internet or would you? <laughs> <But> anyway, 
<laughs> it's probably probably better not to, I would say. But yeah. one thing I did like about this film as well was uh, Ethan Hawke is obviously, his character is like very green and not very uh, used to being in the wilderness and being in the harsh kind of uh, environment of, you know, the gold rush frontier and mm. all the all the other kind of people who inhabit those sorts of remote locations and and how rough and ready they probably are. He comes across as this very kind of, you know, very green, young, naive kid. Yeah, the na- naive, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> which is kind of, you kind of go, okay, so he's going to grow up and he's going to harden up and, you know, get on and do. But that's why I think this is an interesting film because it's about him having those qualities and being able to then, when he comes across uh, White Fang, the dog slash wolf, yeah. and sees that he's being mistreated and kind of has empathy for this animal, I think that's coming from a lot of his uh, perhaps innocence and naivety yeah. as opposed oh, yeah. to everyone else who's there who's just like, yeah, harden up because that's what happens and these dogs are here to work and fuck them. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, because yeah, yeah. Right. yeah because he's kind of you know baby faced and fresh eyed and coming at it from a different angle he's able to have that compassion and kind of see beyond just the working aspects of the dog and actually care for it enough to to you know make friends and and treat it <laughs> just the way that any any other dog lover would kind of thing these days because you know we all, we all yeah. love our, our dogs, and to me, all, all the dogs we've always had in our family have always been part of the family as well. Like, they're not just tools or, you know, working equipment or anything. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think it's very easy to relate to for anyone who has, you know, who's, into, who's had pets and all this kind of thing. But uh, it's nice also then to see that Ethan Hawke's character's uh, progression throughout the the film like he does kind of harden up a bit and he does get used to life out on the land and being isolated mm. and work, working his his mind and all that kind of thing and dealing with the people who are a bit rough, more rough and ready so by the end of it he's kind of very independent and able to stand on his own two feet and do his own thing quite yeah. literally but um that he still has manages to maintain that bit of compassion and humanity that you know lets him be mates with a dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's a really nice message and it's a really nice movie in that sense and, you know, very uplifting and how um, his counterpart, Klaus, yes, who's, I forget his name, in, his character's name in the movie, but he kind of like convinces him against his, you know, convinces him begrudgingly to help him out and kind of, you know, through sheer persistence and... Uh, mm-hmm. Will basically convinces him to like help him out and stay with him, and they end up cutting a deal where he like teaches him how to read, and so that he can teach yeah. him how to be a miner. And by the end of the film, they're quite close themselves, and they they're almost like their own little found family, as it were, in that yeah. kind of scenario as well, because they grow quite fond of each other and they bond a lot, and you know, get get Definitely. to know each other quite well. Even Definitely though at the very a beginning, father son thing. Yeah, in the beginning yeah. they kind of he wants nothing to do with him, and he, you know, Ethan Hawke just kind of annoys him and refuses to let, let him leave him alone. <laughs> but by the yeah. end, you know, they're they're obviously very close, and I think that's a really nice story too because it's you know it's, again thinking but thinking about feel good movies and something being uplifting, it's it's nice to see character development into a positive kind of ending in that sense. Like people growing closer, people building relationships, people kind of maybe letting down their guard or opening up to each other and all that kind of thing. So yeah, without you know rambling too too much, <laughs> I did really like it. It's perhaps not the most. If I'm going to be critical for a second, it's not the most uh, quote unquote impressive film in that sense. Like to me, it's very Disney. Well, yeah. It's mm-hmm. very much what you'd expect from a Disney film about these sorts of characters. Yeah. Yeah, the soundtrack's great. It's Hans Zimmer. How can it not be? 
the setting's amazing and the cinematography's great because they've got really good stuff to work with. <laughs> yeah. The sets, though, were really good as well because this is obviously a period piece as as in it's, you know, set historically. And the first, you know, well, I don't know if it's the first, but one of the towns that they go to, yeah, which is where they've, where that where the hotel is and all this kind of stuff, and they go there to get supplies and things. The way that it's built and set up is actually, to me, seems really realistic because people have built like boardwalks everywhere, but they're really dirty because they're covered in mud where everyone's walking, and mm-hmm. there's just like tents and kind of shacks where people are living, and it's a real kind of thrown together frontier town kind of feel which felt very genuine and yeah genuine in a really dirty kind of way like like it would have been at the time and i always really like that kind of stuff because yeah it wouldn't have been too comfortable or you know luxurious in those days (laughs) in those sorts of locations yeah for sure so yeah i like that but to the the main draw of the film which i think you'd probably agree with as well is jed the dog (laughs) (laughs) because there's something this is where uh, he 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 did it as as a dog in the thing as well where he wasn't to me this is like a dog that isn't just there like he seems like he's actually acting (laughs) yes which i know is kind of a weird thing to say but you don't expect animals to be like you know hitting their mark and displaying the emotion they need to (laughs) display and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Whereas I feel trained, like, yeah, yeah, I feel like obviously it's a combination between his nature as a dog, but then also mm-hmm. the the way they filmed him and the trainer and the way they talked to the dog and everything to to elicit the vibes that they're looking for. And yeah, I think just the whole combination is really, really good. And he's just a cool dog. Like there are parts where you can kind of see what he's thinking and. He's telling the story himself, you know. <laughs> yeah, dude. When 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 Jet looks longingly into the nature, into distance, dude, I know exactly what he's feeling. <laughs> also, how did they make the dog jump through a window? That's crazy to me. I mean, it's surely not the only time that had has been done, but it's still impressive to me. Yeah, yeah. And dude, just dog um, rules. <laughs> yeah, like if I was gonna put it like in a cold <clears throat> kind of light, it would be some of the best like dog yeah. training acting yeah. that is around <laughs> you know and I'll, I'll be honest i don't honestly think that a dog is actually knowing that he's there acting on film he's no. just doing what his tra- trainer mm-hmm. wants him to do so <laughs> yeah that's cool he's, he's still a beautiful dog and he seems like he's you know very attentive and, and very well trained and very good at good at what he does basically mm-hmm. so yeah the combination of everything together just it is very heartwarming and very kind of Feel good, I suppose. <laughs> because did you of cry that. when when he tried to get, get him to walk into freedom? Did you cry? I hope you cried. No, I have to say I didn't. <laughs> because that's the bit that I'm like, I've seen this before. Like I've oh, seen this yeah. parody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was memeing hard at the time because because <laughs> I was yeah, like, yeah, this feels like it. And and as the scene went on, I was like, this is it. This is the scene. <laughs> It is true. Yeah, it's such a cliche now. I, I think that's I think that is true that this is where it came from. Maybe? It has to be because it, Actually, it was so not, exactly so what sure. I've seen before. I, I reckon it would have to be because yeah. It is exactly what I've seen. Especially Disney had a bunch of uh dog and boy friendship stories before. Oh, yeah. uh, like where the red fern grows and all that stuff and I could imagine shit like that happening there as well. I'm not so sure if it's <laughs> invented by this. I also wow. don't remember if it was, it probably wasn't a book. I read the book like a decade ago or whatever. I loved it as well, oh, but okay. I don't really remember any, I don't remember any details to be honest. <laughs> but I, I must imagine that scene was in there as well or something like it at least. Well, and that's, that's kind of where I think, thinking of books and stuff like, I think if I was a kid, I would have loved this film obviously a lot more yeah and because it is you know geared for kids but i remember when i was yeah. that age as well i i really got into a series of books which was just some crappy fiction about <laughs> foxes living in ireland Dude, and hell yeah. there were these these stories about these foxes and living their life and going about doing things 
and it was you know realistic it wasn't like they were wearing suits and stuff and talking to each other like <laughs> they yeah. were actual foxes living their life <laughs> and for some reason i got obsessed with them and i really connected with them i thought they were great and then like 20 years later i, I found one at a library and i picked it up and read like five pages and it was just the biggest pile of shit ever no don't <laughs> say that come on so i stopped reading so i could remember it fondly from when i was a kid <laughs> oh because they're very yeah, much kids know. books you know so yeah. very much uh limited in scope <laughs> well not all zero fiction stories can be watershed down i guess but yeah i've i think i mean a white fang the movie for me obviously held up i i also i'm pretty confident that the jack london novel would hold up for me well i did yeah. read it as an adult so it's not like a childhood memory that one jack well, london speak yeah Speaking of holding up, I think this did actually hold up quite well because I yeah. forgot that it was from 1991 because it's also a historical kind of period piece. Right. So it it isn't really dated in that sense because it's, you know, set yeah. back in the day. But the production is quite good in that sense because, you know, how some older films have certain pacing or especially audio design and that sort of thing, which kind of dates it no matter when it's set or anything like that. This one was pretty good like it didn't really it didn't make me think oh god yeah this is classic 1991 <laughs> <laughs> it just made me think oh yeah this is an older film but still good you know how how good did it make you feel though where your spirits well, lifted <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say because the other thing which i think for me a good element of feeling good and being uplifted is surprise and oh. unexpect, unexpected resolutions and whatnot. This one has none of that. It's nah. super predictable. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Which, again, like I, I don't want that to sound like a criticism because I don't think it's trying not to be. It's just telling a nice story, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And in that sense, it wasn't super, super, you know, the sun didn't start shining down on me or anything when I stopped watching it. It, it was like, <laughs> oh. That was nice. That was a decent, nice Disney film. <laughs> that was my response, essentially. One of the greatest stories ever told, man. It's pure. I movie. mean, is it? <laughs> yes. There's the thing, you know, with feel good movies, uh, I think that's obviously a thing that what the one person gets that feel good uh, experience from is to another person just a uh, fluffy cliche nothing or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. And I've, uh, I I can't even, surely part of it is nostalgia, but I can't really put my finger on why this story, even though it is very fluffy, very predictable, like you said, very Disney. <laughs> I don't, I can't entirely say why this one works for me so well. You're right, mm. it's completely predictable. It's not groundbreaking, really. It just does what it wants to do well enough, I mm. guess. And it makes yeah, it's, it's me very feel solid so in that sense. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like I say, I I keep saying it, but I feel like if I watched this when I was younger, I'd probably mm. connect with it a lot more. You know, like like last time when we were talking about um the the films we were talking about last time, basically, and <laughs> the, yeah. the romantic kind of oh, lighthearted yeah. com comedy movies or whatever, they obviously rely on your own subjective kind of experience as well. Right to connect to and i think this is kind of in line with that where it's a similar sort of genre which doesn't necessarily surpass your own experience or you know age or where you're at when you watch it you have to kind of fit the the demographic in that sense a little bit more than maybe some other films in the world yeah which is fine that's what i mean nothing wrong with that it's okay to make a film that's targeted and works for that target yeah of course. so you know in that sense it's a very a good success and yeah that's what i mean it didn't i guess my overall impression is that it didn't like it's not something that's going to stay with me forever but i wasn't expecting it to to really love it that much either to be fair because okay yeah. i i have a friend who <laughs> when we were growing up in the 90s and we were hanging out a lot together we would go to the video store a lot and rent movies and she would always find whatever film had an animal on the cover yeah and just go let's let's get that one <laughs> Hell yeah. and so we saw a 
we saw a lot of bad, usually comedies and, and kids comedies featuring various animals in wacky situations, <laughs> which thankfully this was not. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, actually that makes me appreciate this even more because here's a dog that's actually mostly treated like a dog with its animal yeah. emotions or whatever you could, would call that. It's not the quirky, funny, where you hear the thoughts making jokes or whatever, or sniffing <laughs> other's butts for a joke or whatever. Actually, yeah, well, here's, I, a, here's an animal story that takes the animal with respect. I think well, that and, makes and a, a lot of I it. really enjoyed that about it too. I think that's one thing I, I really did like. And there's no great, there's no like big moment. There is a moment where he kind of half rescues Ethan Hawke, but not really right. like there's like a cave in in Ethan Hawke's mine and he gets buried. Right, yeah. So the dog starts digging away and eventually helps dig away the rubble to free Ethan Hawke just as a dog would. But it's not the thing I liked. It's not like, you know, some great tragedy happened and the dog act went beyond itself and yeah. saved, saved his life in a really miraculous kind of way that you'd never expect. And that's why they fell in love and rah, 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 you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're I'm right. Glad, I'm glad they didn't do that. They just did very realistic things. <laughs> and as, as and realistic even, as a Disney film goes, yeah. Yeah, but, we, but you know, you, you can believe that it's a dog and this is how a dog would act. You know? Yeah. And it's a very it's a very believable story in that sense and very genuine and authentic, which um which goes a long way for me as well because mm-hmm. I like that kind of thing way more than the, you know, <laughs> the seal dressed up in a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> that sounds <laughs> awesome. I think that's. I'm thinking it's a movie called Dunstan Checks In, but that Good could be an orangutan. I can't I think, remember. Yeah, I know. I think that's a monkey that you're thinking of. It could be a. Uh, there was one with a seal, and I remember there's a seal wearing like a, a baseball cap, <laughs> a Hawaiian shirt, and some sunglasses, <laughs> and it's just yeah, no, the I, worst. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds awesome. What do you mean? <laughs> Maybe Jet yeah. the dog got some uh, competition. Well, have to find out what that seal's name is and <laughs> yeah. follow him down his IMDb list. <laughs> I'm sure it's long and prosper. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, you 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 were saying earlier you, uh, you know, we were talking about predictability, and you were saying that oftentimes with like feel good stories, you expect some sort of surprise, maybe. Would there be something in this story where you would have uh, preferred something unexpected, something specific maybe? Yeah, I don't think it's a case of expecting to be surprised. It's more just if I am surprised, I'm more likely to be delighted, I guess is what I was getting wow. at there. <laughs> okay, well. And, this, and that's what I mean. I didn't necessarily need that from White Fang because yeah. I feel like it's a complete film regardless. I don't feel like there was anything missing or anything I necessarily would have done differently to tell this kind of story because it sits in its position or it does what it tries to do really well and succeeds at it, I think, even if it's not, you know, my favourite thing I've ever seen. I think it still does what it sets out to do well and even and perhaps better than I expected too because I was thinking of some really tragic Disney fucking cliche <laughs> film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck those. But it actually raised above itself above that and <laughs> was much yeah. more enjoyable. I think so, I can yeah. predict your rating on this. This this sounds well, very much like the uh, classic. I have one in mind, so <laughs> <laughs> close. <laughs> close? Oh no! Don't tell me it's a six out of ten. Yep. Oh man. Yep. Three stars out of five. Damn. That's how I think about it, and that's where. That is nowhere near a criticism on the movie. That's largely based on how much I enjoyed it or slash yeah. didn't or how, how much it changed my life in the realm of other films <laughs> that I've seen and enjoyed. And it's the kind of film like, yep, I watched it. That was enjoyable. Cool. But I really i am done. <laughs> What's next? Kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah. Are you not clamoring for White Fang 2? Although Sadly Jed not. is not in that one, unfortunately. No, I might look up Jed though and find some more Jed movies. Yeah, there's one. There's only one more Jed movie I haven't seen yet. Another Disney movie. Oh, so that well, could be cool. Go. 
but maybe it's there was a good sad. there was a good bear in there as well if, from memory oh I yeah think. bart the bear i believe he was yeah, yeah bart yeah. the bear yeah yeah he was good dope. big grizzly yeah but have your obligatory grizzly bear when you're in northern canada obviously yeah <laughs> uh so yeah what do you rate this though as oh, a nostalgic right. fan well it's uh it's easily a nine out of ten for me i still adore this movie from beginning to end nice. honestly it's the kind of movie where i could see myself uh in years coming uh to give it a 10 out of 10 at some point yeah it means a lot to me but yeah and it make me, make me very feel make me feel very good and Is unlike kinda... maybe your pick <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to transition to that now? Let's do that. I, I think that makes sense. <laughs> All right. I'll intro it first. And yes. yeah, I am <laughs> fascinated to hear what you have to say about this one. So the film I chose was a 2014 film called Aloft. It is directed and written by Claudia Losa and starring Jennifer Connelly, Killian Murphy, Melanie Laurent and William Schimmel and Zen McGrath, as well as others, but they're the main ones. And this film, part of the reason I wanted to bring it was because I love it, like, a lot. And no one else seems to. <laughs> <laughs> because it's got, like, 17% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's, like, averages about 2 out of 5, I think, on Letterboxd or something like that. It's widely not very well received. <laughs> I even looked at the Wikipedia page for it uh, before this episode, mm. and outside of Spain, it didn't do very well. It only made about 50 grand at the box office, which we all know is terrible. But in Spain, it was quite well received because Claudia <laughs> Losa, who wrote and directed it, okay, I think okay. is Spanish herself, and it was shot a bit in Madrid as well, so it was kind of half made in Spain as well as, again, in Canada. And... So it did quite well in Spain. It, it made like a few hundred grand or something just in Spain, <laughs> which Good. I think is hilarious Great. because yeah. <laughs> just the disparity there. But um, yeah, so the story is essentially, uh, well, the plot points, for want of a better word, uh, Jennifer Connelly plays a woman who has a couple of kids. Uh, one of them is played by Zen McGrath, the, the kid character called Ivan, who then when he's older is played by Killian Murphy. And essentially the film starts off with uh, Jennifer Connelly and her son Ivan and her other son Gully who has like an inoperable brain tumour. So they're going to this, you know, kind of secret mysterious spot in, I think it's in Manitoba, uh, Canada, maybe if I'm right. Don't correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, doesn't matter. It's in Canada. It's cold. And... They go, they're going with a bunch of other families and stuff to go see this faith healer, healer known as the architect who basically builds these uh, structures out of twigs and, and wood that are meant to have healing properties and that sort of thing. And people who essentially have children most of the time who are you know severely disabled or sick or dying or whatever, as a last resort, they might go see this faith healer and hope to get healed by this dude. At the same time, Ivan, the kid, is into falconry and has a falcon. Who he He's just there kind of along for the ride because he's with his single mum and his brother. And before another kid manages to get healed by the healer, his falcon kind of flies into the structure and destroys the whole thing and, you know, pisses off everyone around basically. But in that action, Jennifer Connelly's character, who's called Nana in the film, uh, her real name's Alana, but everyone calls her Nana, she basically protects this other kid and then later on finds out that he has his eyesight or whatever was wrong with him uh, get, has been healed. And so she becomes some something of a faith healer as well because everyone thinks that she has the power to basically lay on hands and heal children to be better and all this kind of thing in the meantime <laughs> without yeah. without going into the whole film but there's there's then a scene later where she is uh with the architect and and healing a child 
by, you know, going on a big swing with her and everything. But because she's a single mom, she's got her two kids in the car and Ivan, Killian Murphy's character, kind of gets a bit bored and a bit pissed off and decides he's going to drive them home. But it ends up driving his car into a lake and tragedy ensues. And then uh, basically because of that, Jennifer Connelly's character, Nana, takes off and leaves Ivan and essentially they don't see each other again. Meanwhile, in present times, Killian Murphy's now grown up He's got his own family. He's got a wife and a child. And a journalist shows up at his door to interview him about his falcons. But then he quickly finds out that she's actually interviewing him about his mum, who is this mysterious kind of figure these days. Like this is decades later. And she's known as a faith healer who is very hard to get to and is very almost like a cult-like kind of following of people who keep her location and and identity even, and all that, a bit of a secret. And because Ivan has a bunch of trauma from when he was a child associated with his mum, he kind of tells the journalist to fuck off and don't come talk to me (laughs) because, you know, I don't want to talk about my mum. But then, you know, she kind of proves that she can, she actually can get to Jennifer Connolly. And so he and her go on this kind of journey uh, right up into the Arctic Circle and... In, in an effort to kind of locate Nana and for him to locate his mum. And we then find out not too far in that the journalist is sick as well, so she's actually looking to be healed yeah. by this faith healer and, you know, so on and so forth. That's that's the basic plot, <laughs> as in that's what happens. But to me, that's not what the movie's about. <laughs> because this movie, to right. me, is about contrasts in just about every facet of uh, society or as in human beings and in the environment. And Jennifer Connelly's character of Nana is such a fascinating character to me because she's not necessarily very likable. She's a bit of a bitch, actually. (laughs) (laughs) And she's really cold and hard and practical Mm -hmm. to her sons and... You know, she's got a son who's dying of a brain tumour and she basically tells him, harden the fuck up and deal with it. And not in so many words, but that's her attitude. Yeah. And and eventually when she find, she gets sucked into this whole other world of faith healing and being this kind of, you know, nurturing mother to other children, she basically goes and abandons her own children and her own child in Ivan who then obviously carries that trauma throughout his adulthood because when Killian Murphy's character kind of, when he finds out that he, he potentially can find his mother and, and meet her again and essentially confront her and or reconnect with her, it's kind of a bit ambiguous there. Probably a bit of both, to be honest. I'm not sure his, about that. Yeah, his, his change in his demeanour is also, I find, fascinating because he seems to have this kind of comfortable life where he's his his occupation is breeding falcons because he's still into falconry yeah. and he has a wife who loves him and he's got a kid and all this kind of thing so he's you know quote unquote doing all right but it's funny how whenever there are scenes where he's uh either getting close to his mother or when he first kind of decides to go on the journey with the journalist he, he takes on this whole kind of childlike demeanor where he gets really excited and he's he has this kind of naivety about him and it seems like he's a kid again kind of thing like because that's the relationship that he has with his mum and, it and it's never developed beyond that. And so, yeah, so to, for me, <laughs> and, well, on top of that, there's his falconry as well, which is a very central theme to the whole, whole film where... He, because he is a falconer, he has his falcon, his main falcon with him the whole time. And when he's traveling north into the Arctic Circle with the journalist, he also has this a falcon with him as well. And so part of that is every every day or every now and then he takes him out and lets him fly around and, you know, be free and all that kind of thing and, and have a good fly around. And to me, that's like, it makes me kind of raise questions about is... Is, he, is that helping him deal with his trauma because he it's very freeing and it's very kind of 
opening and uplifting, or is it his way of perhaps controlling something that is free because it always comes back to him and and oh sure and they they you know to to calm down the falcons and all that they always put hoods on them so they can't see and they put them in a little box and carry them around okay. kind of thing which is kind of weird <laughs> Matt's having yeah. issues with this already <laughs> <laughs> I think that no actually I think that was one point that I actually I'm like yeah okay I can see that <laughs> so yeah, yeah, to me on, this yeah. I'll, I'll let you speak in a second because I'm very, very <laughs> fascinated to what you what you think about this. But um, yeah, that's where to me this film is like just dripping with layers of subtext and sure. metaphors and themes and symbolism and everything. And I love that there are characters who are complex that you don't actually like very much. But like Nana herself, Jennifer Connelly's character, like. She is this kind of warm, giving kind of motherly character, but at the same time, she's a shit mum. <laughs> and she's a real kind of cow, and she's really hard and and withholds love from her own children, but then yeah. freely gives it to other people as for her own kind of ego sake of being this central faith healer kind of character. Was that the reason, her ego? I, I honestly couldn't tell it. why she <laughs> did that stuff. I mean, that's what I mean. It's a bit cult-like as well, because especially in the later kind of, you know, grown-up se- uh, yeah. era scenes where she's very secretive and stuff, and she is this kind of almost like a deity kind of character, the way people yeah. treat her. And I think she likes it. <laughs> like, I, I don't <laughs> think she's she's not doing it begrudgingly. <laughs> like... <laughs> But um, but anyway, yeah, that that's my my initial kind of assessment on the film. I love this f- film. It's it's to me, it's just everything I love in a film, and it's amazing. And it's it's also nice and slow. It's it doesn't rush anything. It kind of just takes its time to get through each little thing, and yeah, and the setting is just so stark and amazing. And yeah, what do you well. reckon? <laughs> I mean, I agree that the setting was good. Like, to start with a bit of a positive <laughs> stuff. Yeah, when I when I started watching this, I was, like, pretty happy. We, we both chose movies that were, like, in snowy environments, cold environments. Uh, and <laughs> we also both had movies with an animal theme yeah. in it. That was cool. And, like, falconry is a dope thing that I don't think as much in movies. So I was, like, actually really curious how they would use it. But like that was the first disappointment, in my opinion. You you said uh, just now the thing with um, what one might read into the meaning of him having the falcons, uh, what that might mean in terms of like a sense of control or power or something else, or maybe that the freedom thing. I could mm. kind of get behind that, but other. But there's also the thing like a caged bird is such a cliche image and I didn't really see them use the whole falconry thing for really anything else aside from that, which I thought was kind of a bummer. I don't even think the bird had to be there. And and also the first scene that you uh, described where they um, in the past visit this fey healer for the first time and the bird destroys the stick hut that, mm. which made all the people really really angry at them and even made the uh, sh- made one of them shoot the bird dead um that was a really hard sell for me to get into really? that yeah to to get into that uh environment as a viewer the whole fey healer thing already was really flimsy to me just like the weird stick house and <laughs> even even like after that like once the stick house was destroyed by the bird was like the whole world was over or whatever but like couldn't the faith healer still do his shit without the stick house is it really that dramatic that's that's a hard sell for me as a viewer i didn't really <laughs> i couldn't relate to any of these people or whatever or found that like the conflict was very interesting in that sense. I mean, I don't necessarily relate with faith healing myself. No, yeah, I, I get <laughs> like, that. I don't, but... 
I'm not really into it, if if form a better word. But uh, I thought it was fascinating as a as a kind of vehicle to tell the story because it is like you say it's the the architect builds these structures which are meant to like you know help help channel the faith healing and all that kind of thing sure and the one thing i like about the movie it never tries to claim that that is accurate or real in fact that's that's a lot of the ten that's some of the tension between killian murphy and jennifer connelly is like whether it's full of shit or not anyway and you know there are kids who get better and heal and all this kind of stuff but you don't know if that's because of the faith healing stuff or because of something else like it's never i think directly yeah. claimed outside of the people who are doing it i don't think it's directly claimed to be the reason for the healing kind of thing it's not like the film is trying to make an argument that faith healing works or something no yeah i agree <laughs> with that no it's it's also not trying to say that it absolutely doesn't work it's just kind of leaving it open so but I think your comparison between the like flimsiness of the structure, <laughs> to me, that's kind of like directly related to the flimsiness of the faith healing in itself. You know, <laughs> like I mean, sure, but what uh, for me, it's the flimsiness of the script because that was a really <laughs> lazy way to it, initiate like conflict, but then, in my opinion, also didn't really lead to very interesting. Uh, continuation or resolution of that and I think that kind of drew itself through the entire story for me because there was plenty of ground for really interesting conflict, a conversation and a development but I didn't see in any of the uh, I didn't see in any of the parts of the movie the that in a level that I would have wanted to even up until the end where the final confrontation was so nothing to me uh, you, you, when you described the movie, you had you saw a lot of character development in Celia Murphy's character that I did not see. To be honest, <laughs> I thought, I thought he was probably the least interesting character in the story for me, and very oh, one. He was very one note for me, which is weird because he was probably like the centerpiece of it all and could have. Uh, provided the most interesting stuff for the story, but it was one of the most nuanced performances I've I ever seen. I did not see it. I guess I couldn't <laughs> break through that layer to get into the real stuff or whatever. He was ve- he was very much just a one note brooding guy for me. And then in the wow. end, when there's finally the I guess spoilers or whatever, when there's finally the confrontation yeah, yeah. or the meeting with the mother. Uh, with great old age makeup, actually, to have a one positive. <laughs> I really thought that was great. When they finally have the meetup, the confrontation, uh, it's just like a quick burst and then a, uh, I guess, uh, vague sort of... Uh, I, like there's, uh, It's not that I want to have all the answers and like a clear great ending or whatever but there was just nothing there to latch on for me there's there's really? this whole movie of backstory and uh confrontation growing and characters that we see over the years go through a whole life that was shaped by the initial situation whatever but then the ending is just like a brief puff with uh nothing to really end it for me I didn't but see like, the point. <laughs> after all that, and after all that, oh, when they finally meet and everything, and his own mother doesn't even recognize him initially, and is yeah. kind of like, who the fuck are you? And he has to kind of explain himself, and then she figures who out who he is and then doesn't even give a shit, basically. Like, she, do, she kind of does in her own way, in her own fucked up kind of yeah, 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 way for that true. character. Because she yeah. does kind of help him out, but she doesn't care enough to like stick around and talk to him or like find out about his life or anything. Or it just, you know, all of that stuff doesn't matter. She goes right back to this is the role I'm playing. I'm this faith healer, a fucking yeah. amazing woman kind of thing. I'm going to go do that now again. <laughs> and it's I just like my- the culmination of the whole thing. I think my problem is not like the themes are there. The themes are solid. The themes are, have potential, but I don't, 
I was missing the actual conversation that would dig the themes up and like walk through them. I was missing a lot of that. The same thing, honestly, yeah, with the with like Cillian Murphy's character and the journalist traveling like through pretty much the entire movie together, traveling to uh, Faith Healer Mom. Um, there was <laughs> so much more opportunity to have actually interesting fights or conversations, but for the most part, it was the same brooding, shouting, going on to the next uh, location again and again. But isn't that, like, like, for me, that was, like, so authentic, though. Like, this is realism. This is, like, harsh realism. And and that's where I thought, like, <laughs> Killian Murphy's performance was so good because he managed, for me, to get across so much just without even saying a word. Like, his emotional range was just on show for me, I the whole movie. I know, I know you say it's, like, for you it's one note, but... For me, it's like, man, the dude's got depth and range. Like, <laughs> but even in on that note, when you say it was realistic to you, um, I don't think that's the point of the story, though. I don't. The, I think the story would have been worth more if instead of trying to be realistic and vague or whatever, to use the setting to process the themes more and probably give up more of the realistic emotional depth or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I was missing the movie to actually do something with the characters and themes that were there. Maybe it was a <laughs> bit too fly on the wall for me. It just didn't have the bite. It just had it's had the it's had it had the meal right in front of them on the <laughs> platter, but they didn't bite it. Oh man. Also, the oh god, the you described the scene already where, uh, when they were still kids, the two brothers, and mm. what they drove with the car trying to leave uh, where Faith Healer Mom was doing the Faith Healer things, <laughs> then drive in the frozen lake, and the sick kid drowns. That whole scene was like, was so, I mean, predictable, but also like really melodramatic like out of a hallmark movie or something it was <laughs> that i couldn't take it seriously at all and and that's like pretty much the instigator for everything that follows i think so yeah, it was yeah, already absolutely. built on like shifty on like shifty stick out so to me that was like the the, the culmination of jennifer Connolly's character just basically uh, neglecting her own children yeah and we Kind of the, yeah. the reason Ivan gets pissed off is because he goes to find her and wonder what she's doing, only to find that she's like dedicating herself to helping another child and yeah. giving all of herself to some other kid. So he's like, screw this, let's get out of here. And, you know, obviously fucks up and they crash the car. But that sequence up until the crashing of the car kind of, to me, again, feels really authentic and genuine and, <laughs> and you know, really believable for me because... Again, he's a kid. Like he's not, he's not rational or anything. He's he's reacting emotionally to guess, the situation, yeah. and throughout the film before that, she's really just hard with these kids. Like she's she cares and she loves her children, but at the same time, she's really hard with them and really distant with them and kind of withholds yeah. her love from them, which you know, in well, by definition, is abusive, and. So they have right. had to deal with this anyway. And as the older brother, he's always been told that it, he has to be responsible and, you know, he has to look after his younger brother and all this kind of thing. So he's like, well, okay, I'm making a decision and we're going because fuck you. <laughs> and so, yeah, to me it felt like, I don't know, obviously we disagree, but to me it felt <laughs> yeah. really, really uh, just full of good good substance and, and good stuff. And stuff to really sink your teeth into. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I just didn't see it. You're not alone, so... <laughs> I, clearly, yeah. <laughs> if, if anyone is objectively wrong here, it's me. But <laughs> just by sure. the critical reception and everything. <laughs> so, I you guess. know, I understand that. Don't worry, I'm not... <laughs> it's not lost on me. But uh, I do have... Like another positive that I do give, I, I did like Cornelis' performance a lot. 
Even if I didn't yeah. like the character writing, I liked her performance a lot. She was pretty great in that sense. Yeah. Unlike, well, I mean, it also helps me, like... Well, like, Jennifer Connelly and Killian Murphy are, like, two of my favorite actors. So I it helps that. that they're the leads in this anyway. Mm-hmm. But, but, yeah, like... Well, like, do you remember when when Killian Murphy decides that, okay... Like, he initially tells the journalist to bugger off, but she leaves him, like, a CD which has some footage of his mum. Yeah. To yeah. kind of show that she knows where she is. So he goes to find her at her hotel. And the way he just kind of, like runs into the hotel and he's like, he's almost jumping champion at the bit kind of thing to talk to her. Like a little kid who's just, you know, on Christmas morning ready to open his presents, you know, because he's thought about it and he's like, I can, I can reconnect with my mother. I can do this. And that's what I mean by like, he embodies that childish kind of naivety that kind of was, had to, was forcibly stopped in him as a kid when, you know, his mother left. And so whenever she gets closer, it kind of re re fires itself within him. And he has this kind of like childlike quality that then oscillates between being the adult and understanding, you know, how shit his upbringing was. So you get that huge contrast between uh, different aspects of his character and, and his personality to me anyway. So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I, I, I could, (laughs) <laughs> I could see it being there, but it clearly just didn't arrive at yeah. my brain that way or whatever. No, that's, yeah. that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. You can, <laughs> you can be wrong. I can, just I like can be else. wrong, yeah. <laughs> I'd be proudly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so do I even dare ask you for a rating? Jeez. Good God. Uh, fuck. It probably wouldn't be more than four out of ten. That's like the best I, I would give it. God damn. Yeah, that's about that's about what everyone else gives it to, so fair enough. <laughs> I guess that's true, yeah. Cause for me this is like a solid ten out of ten. That's wild. <laughs> like an unequivocal oh, but, ten out of ten. <laughs> like that's not a problem, but I really wanna know though is how was this a feel good movie for you? Oh, because, because yeah, <laughs> this is where I knew this was a little bit of a you know mm-hmm. risk with the whole feel good thing, because it is quite a depressing story overall. It's it's you know yeah. fairly dark, I would say. But the reason this is feel good for me is because I love films where they don't tell you very much. They leave you know, open for interpretation. They ask a lot of questions. They don't necessarily give you answers. They do resolve. Like I feel like this had a good res- re- resolution in the end or a realistic resolution in the end. It wasn't corny. It wasn't cliched. It didn't It didn't knock you over the head with, this is what we're talking about. All that stuff makes me feel so good. And, <laughs> and I find that stuff really uplifting. And I've watched this film a number of times. And every time I watch it, I walk away just going, oh, man, the world is good. And... Life is great, and I want to be a better person. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about that ending real quick, a little bit, that resolution. <laughs> to me, it really was just a, a way too short burst of, uh, like, uh, Killian Murphy's character, like, venting his anger mm. and his sorrow, and then maybe, like, a vague sense of acceptance in the final scene. And I, mm. what, what are you inter, what are you taking from the resolution though? Because I didn't feel that was very much, that wasn't much of a resolution. But I feel like it was the only resolution that could ever happen. Like to stay true to these characters who I feel like are really, in my mind, really well written, really in depth and nuanced characters. And Jennifer Connelly's character, especially, if she suddenly was like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm a bad mom, I'm gonna, I want to, I love you, and please hang on, let's have cake and shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> that would not be her. Like, this is not a nice woman, really, at the end of the day. Yeah. In my book. <laughs> so her son shows up decades later, who she doesn't even recognize, and then eventually he vents all this trauma to her. Yeah. Things that he's been hanging on to as he's grown into a man, lived his own life. And her response is basically, is a rock. All right. All right. Cheers. I'll see you later. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and to me, but to me, that's everything because that 
it's like Killian Murphy gets to say what he wants to say to his mother who has been absent and he who's always been this mystery and also shrouded in this kind of folklore of being this almost demigod semi yeah. who's, you know faith healer that there's these cult like people follow and all mm. this kind of stuff so she's not even just an absent mum she's an absent mum who other people are worshiping in a way and yeah for him to then actually get the opportunity to tell her what he really feels essentially <laughs> is a resolution in itself because he, he can, you know, let go of that. I would hope and go back to his own family and be like, well, that's an example of how not to live. See you later and have his own kind of decision in that process, which he never had before, you know? And I feel like Jennifer Connelly's character is just, you know, irredeemable in that sense. And, <laughs> you know, she's not a nice character. And I don't know how many times I can say it, but <laughs> she, yeah, I think she's very it's not making complex. Me feel good. <laughs> well, but this is why it does make me feel good, though, because it's like perhaps that's more reflective of where I'm at in my life. You know, I'm mm. a bit more middle-aged, that sort of thing. So I value being able to move on from things that maybe I've held on to. Or, yeah, okay, yeah. you know getting over shit from when I was younger. Life for me is less about anything that has come before. It's more about what's to come ahead. Yeah. You know, and I think that's maybe that's something about getting older and like time changing and all that kind of stuff because, you know, you experience time differently as you go through life. And perhaps that's why it spoke to me a lot differently in a way. Like I hadn't really thought about it till now, but I, you know, I don't think age counts for much, but, sometimes those differences can kind of raise their head a bit, I guess. And your focus can be di in different places. So maybe that's why I got a lot more out of it in a way, because I can relate more in a way, <laughs> perhaps uh, like on a personal level. <laughs> the, the sentiment of moving on from uh, struggle, struggling times or whatever. It, that is what I was expecting the movie to land on when I started it. And I would, I could see how that would make you feel good. Obviously, movies <laughs> where people go through all sorts of um, fights and obstacles, but then come out of it as yeah. better grown characters. Obviously, that's a very easy contender for a feel-good movie. I would agree if that was the case. But I think for <laughs> that, the actual um, the points where this story decided to end on wasn't there yet, I think. And that's mm. why... <laughs> <laughs> I can see I can see how if you didn't really connect with anything in the film yeah it it, it wouldn't be very feel good for you <laughs> I'll give you that yeah but as someone who connected deeply with this film and very much loved the way it was written and the way the characters were and the performances and the even the setting as well like the environment and the cinematography yeah that was and good, yeah. all that kind of stuff this yeah it couldn't have spoken to me more essentially <laughs> it's wild wild so it made me feel very good yeah <laughs> but i that, that's kind of it, it, and you know to be perfectly honest and upfront that's part of why i wanted to suggest this movie for you to watch yeah i figured because because i knew that you'd either love it or hate it and <laughs> maybe you'd end up hating it anyway and that would be interesting for me so it's kind of a bit selfish in that sense <laughs> <laughs> It fits the premise of this podcast. I can't blame you for yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I I really love it. I'd hey, if anyone else listening to this happens to have seen it or is going to watch it, hey, you better hit me up. Whether uh, when you they, like it or not, if they want to listen to this, they are obligated to watch it. There's no way around it. Yeah, true. And said you hate mail <laughs> to, to Josh. Bring it on. <laughs> I know I'm not alone because I trolled through the letterbox reviews for this movie when I first watched it oh boy. because the first like, you know, million or whatever, not that many, the first <laughs> hundred reviews are like one star. This was a piece of shit. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but I found other people who loved it as much as I did. So I feel somewhat vindicated. <laughs> it's not just me being mental. <laughs> <laughs> it's multiple people being mental. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a shared delusion <laughs> <laughs> sure that's an interesting way to put it yeah yeah <laughs> uh, 
I think uh, it is interesting though because I think it's very different kind of feel good to something like White Fang. Oh yeah. Which, mm-hmm. if if I was going to be super critical of White Fang compared to a loft, I would say White Fang feels like you know surface level very yes. Uh, what's the word? Superficial. Yeah. On and you know there's nothing else to it, whereas to me a loft is like an ocean of depth, which. Obviously, mm-hmm. it isn't for you. <laughs> Subjective, yeah. So, yeah, they 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 bring about different kind of types of feel good, in my view. For sure, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And I'm and yeah, I'm sorry it didn't land for you, but I'm kind of <laughs> glad it didn't as well because that's interesting to me. So. Yeah, I, I I have no regrets. That's all. All good. I just watch White Fang again. I will feel all better. <laughs> <laughs> Watch White Fang, then a loft, then White Fang. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a game, that's a play. Well, yeah. mercifully, then you would have appreciated the fact that a loft is only about an hour and a half anyway. It's not a very long film. Well, one hundred twelve minutes, it says. Yeah, that's about an hour and a half, isn't it? Oh, a bit over, I guess. It's close. I thought it was to like an hours. hour and th- hour and thirty eight. Yeah, I've got an hour and thirty six. Did we watch different versions or something? <laughs> you watched that the extended matter. cut. <laughs> Yeah, that's why it didn't work. Because that would you'd be like the Lord of the Rings extended cut. That would be <laughs> fucked up. There's no way. No, I'm curious. No, I got, gotta check my copy as well. Mine says. No, you you're right. My actual video copy says one hour mm. thirty six as well. I don't know why Letterbox says okay. one twelve. I don't know. Yeah, Letterbox isn't always correct, but yeah, true. There you go. All right. Well. Yeah. Now that we've delved into those let's see what we're going to delve into next time yeah <laughs> see what um, other kind of interesting takes we can have on a genre yeah I'm, I'm gonna spin the wheel here in a minute for to choose our next random subject uh reminder that you can always like contact us make it make a suggestion of what we could put on this wheel or just give a fun little comment on our episodes uh, I'm mm-hmm. going to spin this thing right now. And uh, next time we're going to be blabbering about uh, <laughs> childhood nostalgia. I've just got to get White Fang again. <laughs> <laughs> nostalgia, hey? Oh, man. Are you going to finally bring a feel good movie? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Or are you going to challenge me with some? drama again nostalgia is an interesting one though isn't it because essentially anything could be nostalgic very true yeah and it's depending probably, on who you are and where you saw it and all that kind of thing so it's uh, very subjective by definition already so this could be yeah absolutely all sorts of shit <laughs> yeah i'm gonna have to think about that one nothing jumps to mind immediately but childhood nostalgia in particular not just any old nostalgia. Yeah. Proper childhood. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I mean, I have some obvious ones which I'm not going to... Uh, well, unless you haven't seen them. That's the thing. I think a lot of obvious ideas are probably the stuff that we've both seen already. I mean, if you haven't seen this film, there's something wrong with you. Have you <laughs> I was going to say oh. Back to the Future is like super childhood nostalgia for me. <laughs> I just seen... looked it up to check that you have seen it, and you have, so... <laughs> yeah, do Back to the Future is one of my all-time favorite movies of all time. Yeah, yeah, you go with five stars. It's... Clever, clever man. It's amazing. <laughs> um, uh, uh, politically incorrect title, but have you seen The Indian in the Cupboard before? Because... Interestingly, I was obsessed with the book when I was a child. Oh, no way. Yeah, I read the book and I loved it. Never saw the movie, though. <laughs> you know what? I'm the other way around. Never read the book. Obsessed with the movie. So I think I can already <laughs> lock this in. I Oh, hell yeah. Oh, well, yeah. We have, have a think about it. See how it goes. But of yeah, course, I, haven't, I know the story very well, but I haven't seen the movie. So well, that could be a there fun is that. discussion. Yeah. I didn't even think of Indian in the Cupboard, man. Do that. Yeah, it is, it is a, it's not really the, a, a 2024 movie title though is it <laughs> no nah, no nah, i didn't age well in that sense <laughs> yeah <clears throat> unfortunately that's all right it was another time exactly 
at least they got an actual uh you know native american actor but anyway that's this for <laughs> for the next episode then i guess <laughs> that's that's for the other political podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah the woke cast that that happens in the woke <laughs> Oh man, I still want to make one called Woke Cast now. I surely it exists. Probably, yeah, I, yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Anyway, let's yes. wrap it up there then. Yes. As always, thank you to anyone listening for listening, and by all means, get in touch. Let us know what you think. Let me know how I'm wrong. Let me know how I'm right. How much you love Aloft, and it's the best film ever, and Jennifer Connelly rules. Totally. Or how much you know you're obsessed with Jed the Dog, and you've seen everything he's done, and. Yes how we need to just continue on that path because you can't go wrong. So yeah, wherever you listen to this, you can probably comment at the same time. So by all means do, but other than that, (laughs) Matt's waiting. (laughs) (laughs) If you dare, I will comment on you. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.